Good afternoon. Our webinar today is based on a Wallace research study uh, that was done um, most recently by the Wallace Foundation that really combined all of their efforts to establish five key practices of effective principles. This webinar, Creating a Climate Hospitable to Education, is one of those five key practices. For over 70 uh, reports that the Wallace Foundation has published, this culminating report, The School Principal as Leader, Guiding Schools to Better Teaching and Learning, combines all of the knowledge and information that has been garnered through the Wallace Foundation project since the year 2000. This particular publication can be downloaded on the Wallace Foundation or the NAESP websites. The five key practices, shaping a vision of academic success for all students, creating a climate hospitable to education, cultivating leadership in others, improving instruction, managing people, data, and processes to foster school improvement can be seen by any effective principal in the daily work and their daily practice of school leadership. When the Wallace Foundation published the publication, The School Principal is Leader, they drew on both case studies and large quantitative analysis to find that their research showed most school variables considered separately have at most small effects on learning. But the real payoff is when individual variables combine to reach a critical mass, creating those conditions under which the job of the principal performs. That's why leadership is so crucial to all school growth and student achievement. At this time, we're going to take a quick participant poll. One of the questions that was asked, uh, as the Wallace Foundation did at research, teachers gave feedback in what, I, what was the most identifying element that ranked principals in developing an atmosphere of caring and trust in a school which then did create a climate hospitable to ed education. So would you please take a moment and identify in comparing teacher ratings the most effective principles, which of these four elements would rank number one in developing an atmosphere of caring and trust in a school? And while the audience chooses one of those elements, I will share some other information uh, with you about the Wallace Foundation findings. Evidence really is quite strong in uh, identifying, for example, that school mission and goals, culture, teachers' participation in decision making, and relationships with parents in the wider community as potentially powerful determinants of student learning. The principal creates that climate which is inclusive for all stakeholders to have a laser-like focus on education and student learning. Let's see. We're going to go ahead and close the polls now and share it. Zero percent said principals who set standards for high instructional conversations conversations, instructional focused conversations, 17% of our audience said principals who hire and retain great teachers, 17% of our audience said that principals who manage and balance a leader's responsibilities, and 67% said principals who are visionaries and share leadership. Actually, the number one item that came up when teacher, teachers rated effective principals was number one. <laughs> principals who set standards for highly instructional based conversations. It really is no surprise that if a school is clearly laser focused on great standards and committed to good instructional practices 
And if that conversation leads the teachers and all stakeholders into their common goal, it was the number one area. All of these are quite important and came, uh, had very high ratings, but number one was the most important for effective, effective principles. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. First, we have Susan Holliday. Susan has been a principal at Gladys Noon Spelman Elementary School in Prince George's County, Maryland for five years. She served as an instructional specialist monitoring the instructional programs of 12 K-12 schools and assists in countywide educational initiatives. Susan is an NESP certified principal mentor and has also established an English language learners mentoring program. She is a doctoral candidate of Bowie State University in Maryland, and Susan is a leader in the Wallace Foundation PLC for the county to improve and sustain their district-wide mentor program. Susan has two sons and spends many hours on the sidelines at youth sporting events. We also have Kirk Downing with us today. Kirk is a graduate of the University of Colorado Boulder, where he earned a bachelor's degree in history and a master's degree in curriculum and instruction. He taught and was an assistant principal in Cherry Creek School District in Aurora, Colorado. Kirk moved to Massachusetts in 2007, where he is a principal at Brown Elementary School in Natick, Massachusetts. Kirk is the Middlesex County Director for the Massachusetts Elementary School Principals Association and is also an NASP certified principal mentor. Kirk coaches his sixth grade daughter's basketball team and I'm sure has a winning record with those girls. Peter Carpenter is our other speaker today and Peter's been with Hartford County Public Schools in Maryland for 18 years. He served as a classroom teacher, mentor teacher, assistant principal, instructional supervisor, and now is the principal of Emerton Elementary School. He received a Master's of Science degree in Curriculum and Administration and Supervision from McDaniel College and a doctorate from Wilmington University, where he analyzed the process that three elementary schools went through to establish professional learning communities. He is also an NASP certified mentor. He's the father of twin 12-year-old daughters and is active in his church and community. So we would like to welcome each of our well-qualified speakers today to share how they create a climate hospitable to education. We'll open with Kirk. Kirk, we'll turn it over to you. Great. Uh Thank you, Carol, for that introduction, and I also want to thank Honor for facilitating our webinar today, and welcome all of you uh, to this webinar on cultivating a climate focused on uh, student achievement here. Next. Today I'm going to talk about the principal's role in cultivating conditions that motivate educators to strive for excellence. Much like the farmer has the job of creating conditions under which crops can grow vigorously, the principal has the responsibility to cultivate professional growth in schools that is focused on student success. Next, you can see from this slide some demographics of the school. Currently, I'm the principal of Brown Elementary School in Natick, Massachusetts. Brown is in a suburban setting that is predominantly white with a rising second language population. The majority of second language students at Brown are children of parents with advanced degrees who have come to America for education or business. You can see from our statistics, we also have a significant free and reduced lunch population. Some of those students at Brown are placed here through a homeless placement program. Next, Brown has a history of performing well on the state achievement test. MCAS is the Massachusetts Comprehensive Assessment System. During the last four years, we have focused on maintaining that high performance while also reducing the need for students to receive special education services. In addition, our percentage of second language students has gone up significantly. As you can see, Brown is now under 8% for special education services. When you adjust for students who only receive related services, Brown's special education population is 5.7% today. We have been able to reduce our special education plans and maintain the high performance of the school by implementing 
an effective response to intervention model along with a thorough child study process. What's important to note is that we didn't develop that process instantly. As Mike Matos says, until you provide a compelling reason for change, teachers not only have the right to push back, they have the responsibility. I knew that I needed to build a case for implementing the RTI model we use at Brown today, and I knew it wasn't going to be easy because the staff was already feeling successful. I need to be patient with my expectations knowing I had a vision of where I wanted the school to go. Next, when I was preparing for this webinar, I asked several faculty and staff about what it means to create a climate hospitable to education. Staff members include secretaries, SPED teachers, classroom teachers, parents, counselor, and the school psychologist. The statements you see on this slide summarize the conversations and feedback I received. I want to pull out a, full of these, a few of these themes as I believe they are instrumental to promoting a positive climate. Let's begin with projecting calm and kindness. The staff members I spoke with repeatedly referred to the level of calm and kindness that comes from the principal's office. At Brown School, we have one school rule, that is be nice. If I want the students and faculty to reflect that value, then I need to demonstrate it for them. Next, it is clear where my values and beliefs lie. We have done a lot of work building a strategic vision for the school, and I have certainly expressed my values and beliefs in those conversations. The faculty at Brown know that everything comes back to student learning. Every decision I make comes back to that student learning. I've been successful in doing that because I know that my faculty shares that value with me. By placing my beliefs and values out front, I am showing a transparent agenda that makes the faculty feel reassured. We've all heard the phrase, be the change you want to see in others. For educators to truly adjust to a new vision and direction, they must see the principle reflect this value. It is one thing to say this statement, and it is another thing to live it. Every school has a unique culture steeped in traditions and routines that sometimes go back decades. The principal will get nowhere by pointing out ineffective practice steeped in tradition without providing something to replace it that is more effective and compelling to staff. Instead, the principal should build capacity in people by being the change he wants to see in others. When staff members say a calm, humble, empathetic principal who listens actively and then takes action, they will begin to develop those same characteristics. At the point where trust is finally established, the principal can begin to make significant change that is lasting and sorted by the educational community of the school. Next, so to get to that point, trust must be established. When I became the principal of Brown, the superintendent asked me to create an entry plan that would outline my goals for the school. To create the plan, I interviewed various constituency groups of the Brown School community. The goal was to assess multiple perspectives of the school experience and to determine what work is valued and what work needs to be done. I also use the entry plan process as an opportunity to identify the strengths of every staff member and community member. Initially, I did nothing with my data collection because I wanted to see how the school and community responded when we were faced with challenges. I wanted time to measure people in terms of how they responded to their own values. I can't emphasize that point of study enough. Before implementing change, know in great detail what it is you are attempting to change. What I eventually learned is that the educators at Brown School were after the same goal as I. We wanted every student in our school to feel successful about his or her learning. It sounds obvious, but we need to establish trust before we could believe each other. Next. So there are some specific behaviors principals can take when you're creating a climate hospitable to education. I'll get into those points next. next. To build trust in others, I work by two simple principles. First, be calm and kind to others. Second, keep your promises. I've spoken several times in my presentation about projecting calm and kindness. That is intentional because it is so important throughout all elements of the job. One way you can protect, project your kindness is to compliment the good work people are doing all throughout the school. Sometimes I will tell my office staff, well, it's time to go out and pump up the tires. What I mean by that is I will walk the school with the specific intention to compliment the good work that I see. 
my mindset walking out the door is a positive mindset, and I will see what I expect to see when I walk the halls. If I expect to see negativity, I believe that that's what I will see. Next, it is critical to keep your promises. Every canceled meeting or delayed task is another promise broken. While you know how much you have to balance, your audience does not, nor do they need to know. You can keep all of your promises by staying committed to your schedule and holding yourself accountable. The key to keeping your promises is being specific about what needs to be done and setting a deadline. Avoid terms like as soon as possible or sometime this week. Instead, say things like, I will have it done by Tuesday at 3 o'clock, or let's schedule a specific time to discuss your dilemma. Will 30 minutes be enough? By committing time to a promise, you are communicating to your audience that his or her concern is important to you. Finally, excuse me, the best way to build trust throughout the school is to walk, walk, walk. How many principals have you heard say, I couldn't get around the school today because I had so much to get done in my office? Instead, what if the principal said, I couldn't get to that office work today because I had so many classrooms I needed to visit? If you spend the time visiting the classrooms, what you will begin to see is that the tasks and appointments that are requested of you begin to decrease dramatically because you are so visible around the school. Next. So once you've developed that trust, you can then start to leverage the channels of communication in your school. The first rule of establishing channels of communications is to ask, does this committee or advisory group have a purpose for achieving the school vision? If the answer is no, you should eliminate that channel of communication immediately or change it to meet the vision of the school. <coughs> Each channel of communication needs to be clearly defined. Each one of the committees or meetings stated in the slide has clearly defined objectives. For example, the Principal Advisory Committee meets each month to preview the faculty meeting agenda and provide feedback on what to expect. It is also a forum where I can cross-check my expectations with the union leadership in the school. The union representatives in my school say they appreciate this meeting because I have demonstrated respect for others and the negotiated agreement. With that respect, my teachers are more willing to try new things because they know we are working together. I would say the most important channel of, communication I, channel of communication I have every day is with my office secretary. All channels of communication go through her. She sends out all agendas, sets all of my appointments, and answers 90% of the questions that cross my desk. As a result, I'm freed up to do the thing that I should do most, walk the school. Einstein said, given one hour to solve a problem, I would study the problem for 55 minutes and save five minutes for the solution. What I've shared with you thus far is all the work it takes to establish a climate hospitable to education. This is all the work it takes to study the problem. This represents the 55 minutes. Now I will share the five minutes, and that is two of the solutions we've come up with at Brown School. Next. The first is our ex executive functioning support for every classroom. During my first year at Brown, I often heard about the deficits children showed in their daily work. When we sat down to problem solve those issues, it came down to a deficiency in executive function skills. Working with the strategic planning group and the, and the faculty advisory group, we developed a master schedule for the next year that provided executive functioning instruction in every classroom to start and end the day. Their responsibility was work with the classroom teacher to identify the students who needed to improve organizational skills. We have significant growth in the EF of our students and our interesting unintended outcome happened. The homeroom teachers raised their instruction and expectations for all students. They attributed this to the fact that they want to be at their best when other professionals are in their classroom. The second system we established was a child study process. That is woven into our response to intervention model. This process was the outcome of many conversations in the admin mental health meeting as well as the teacher advisory meeting. Our model consists of a teacher interview with me where she presents an issue with the child. From that interview, we form a committee of professionals throughout the building that changes from meeting to meeting. We do a child study process, focusing on the consultancy model from critical friends, and we identify goals for the child. From those goals, we do six 
to eight weeks of progress monitoring and return to the table to discuss the student's progress. If the student's making progress, we either continue the intervention or discontinue it. If the student isn't making progress, we invite parents into our meeting to elevate our process and attempt another round of intervention. At the conclusion of that intervention, if we're still not seeing the success we want for the student, then we make a referral to special education for a full evaluation. This has resulted in a dramatic decrease in the number of parent referrals we see received at Brown. Over the past two years, we've received nine parent referrals. We had four two years ago, five last year, and this year I've had two. I attribute this success to the work that's being done, not just in the administration office, but through cultivating a hospitable environment for all the faculty and staff here at Brown School. Next. That concludes my portion of the presentation. So I would like to turn it over and thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Kirk. Uh, we got a couple questions for you that you'll be able to answer at the end of the webinar, but you have such a positive attitude and obviously a positive culture in which everyone is um, motivated to work hard. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing your information and your expertise about the principalship. We'd like to turn it over now to thank Susan you. Holliday from Prince George's County Schools in Maryland. Susan? Thank you, Carol. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Susan Holliday, and I'm the proud principal at Gladys Noon Spelman Elementary School. Next. Gladys Spelman Elementary School is located within 10 miles of Washington, D.C. It's a kindergarten through sixth grade model with approximately 500 students. 85% of our students are in free and reduced lunch, so we are a school-wide Title I program. With those 500 students, about 33% of them, or about 160 students, qualify for some level of English language services. Our school is structured two different ways in the primary grades, grades kindergarten through second grade. We are self-contained classrooms. And then in grades three through six, we are departmentalized. So the students see a reading teacher, a math teacher, and a science and social studies teacher. There are several, as Kirk was speaking on, committees and different meetings that are important to the school structure. Our school um, has a leadership team that meets once a month that um, all key decisions that are made with our school, whether it be instructionally, whether it be um, having to do with climate and culture, all of those things go through that leadership team meeting. And the leadership team um, is consisted of grade level chairs, department chairs, a parent sits on that, um, and then any other um, individuals that are involved in those decisions um, come to that meeting. And it is a very open dialogue, so um, that meeting itself is very, very key to our school. Next. How have we created a climate hospitable to all stakeholders? Next. What I'd like to do is to spend some time today talking about leadership skills and practices. And I wanted to speak on four different things, first being transparency, um, then deliberate behaviors, feedback, and fin finally receptiveness. Next. When we talk about transparency, um, we ask of, um, of ourselves of being explicit with what you're going to do and why you're going to do it. Especially in the early stages of principalship or any leadership opportunity, that you have to be, you have to be prepared to explain why you're going to do something. And if you don't necessarily have a reason that goes back to what's best for students, then it's probably not the best idea. It shouldn't be about you. It shouldn't be about somebody making a decision in um, that what is either easiest for them or whether they think it's best. It really should be rooted um, in what is best for students. And during those um, initial uh, months and years of a uh, school principalship, you just have to be very, um, you have to be prepared to explain why you're asking people to do things. And I think that's um, the same when it comes to community members and when it comes to parents, that they're going to ask questions. And so being very transparent about some of your actions are going to be very important. And the second thing is informing all stakeholders about your methods of communication. When I arrived at Spelman six years ago, I surveyed teachers and parents um, and other community members about how, what's the best way to communicate with you. Are you an email person? Are you a telephone person? How is the best way to be able to communicate with you? And I knew that I had to have several methods of communication. 
and I had to um, zero in on those methods with those individuals. That they might not always want to be flexible. There might be parents that are just email people, but I knew that I had to be flexible. So knowing um, how different individuals wanted to be able to be communicate with was really, really important, and I kept to those communication pieces. Next, speaking on deliberate behaviors, Kirk mentioned that. Um, uh, briefly also, is being strategic with your actions when you speak with stakeholders. You have to know your audience. Each, sto each stakeholder has a different need. Find that need, whether it be a parent, a community member, a teacher, a student. They're all going to come with a different um, need or even a different lens. And to be able to really hone in on, well, what, did, what are they coming with? What, what are their thoughts behind this? If you're a community member, what are your thoughts or what, what do you believe is the driving force? And understand that that positive change that's going to happen within a school, it doesn't happen by chance. It happens with very deliberate actions. So prior to any major changes in the building or any major changes that you might make with um, the structure of the instructional program, maybe a possibly a change in how um, a testing plan would go into place, that to be very strategic about it and to have those very deliberate behaviors. Next, please. The next um, skill and practice is having feedback. And um, after key events in schools, ask for feedback from st stakeholders. But if you're asking for that feedback, you have to be willing to hear what they have to say and to not take it personally. Um, and make use of their feedback, um, going back to that deliberate behavior that even if a parent suggested a, um, they want to um, be able to identify how they can help their child at home with homework. And even in the back of your mind, well, we've already thought about that. But it's really important to be able to say, oh, based on this particular parent's um, idea about a homework help session in the evening, this is why we created this evening. So know that um, it's very important for parents to know that whatever they have to share with you in regards to feedback and next steps, that you're very deliberate about saying, based on um, the feedback that we got, this is why we're making the change. I also wanted to share with you um, what we do after every first day of school, that we go back to what we said the year before. And after the first day of school, I send a feedback um, email to the faculty and say, what went well today, the good, the bad, and the ugly? Um, many times we're able to recognize what didn't go well, but we rarely take the time to say, because we did this, this went well. And um, we spend a lot of time on having reflective practice. We certainly cannot um, identify what didn't go well and what went well if we don't take the time to actually reflect on how we did it. So um, spending um, the time and energy that it takes to be um, reflective is so, so important. We've done the same thing after back to school night. And I keep track of those notes, and I you know, archive them on my computer. And that way, before I set an agenda or I look at a structure for something, I go back to the year before and say, oh, yeah, what, what went well? How do we need to do that again this year? Um, because some of those structures um, and some of those next steps come from feedback. Next, please. Finally, um, is the area of receptiveness. And stakeholders will always share their thoughts. Um, we have to be willing to listen, and we have to be available. And sometimes the availability um, comes from just making that face-to-face -face conversation. As much as technology has played a huge role in making um, many facets of our job easier, we can't lose um, the personal connections that it that takes place through an actual conversation with somebody. So as much as it might be easier to email a parent who responded to a concern, or it might be easier to um, pick up the phone and make a quick phone call, those face-to-face -face conversations are so meaningful for parents to see that level of sincerity that you have. And I think it also um, says, uh, means the world to teachers. Many of them, we've all opened our doors. And when we walk in the door, we have this set agenda for what we need to do and that um, coin phrase of, do you have a minute? And you know it's not going to take a minute, but it's really important to be able to give them the time and that personal attention. And one of the things that I, I really take pride in is many of my teachers and even the parents have said, Susan, regardless of how many people you interact with, when I speak with you and I have those meetings, I feel like I'm the only person. And that's very important, um, that as large as our job might be to have those personal um, connections with people, and being receptive to what they have to say. We've, um, many parents um, and even teachers don't necessarily agree on um, some of the next steps and some of the key areas, but we have to be receptive um, to each other's feedback and know that we're going back to those um, initial piece of 
um, with deliberate behaviors that it's important to make sure that we hear what they have to say and being very transparent, but it, it should all go back to what's best for kids. And if we, in the end, if we can't narrow it down to what we think is going to be best for children, then that, those decisions are probably not the best choice. Next. I want to thank um, Carol uh, and the Wallace Foundation for their, this opportunity, and I look forward to any questions that you have. Thank you, Susan. We also have a couple questions for you at the end of our, our webinar today. Um, I think that you are the epitome of an open and honest and culture of acceptance for um, all the stakeholders in your school. Uh, it's really impressive how you deliberately act and how you uh, problem solve and make decisions based on feedback. So thank you for sharing all of that with us today. You're most welcome. Next we have Peter Carpenter from Hartford County Schools in Maryland. Welcome, Peter. Thank you so much, Carol. It's really great to be here with everybody this afternoon. As Carol said, I'm the proud principal of Emerton Elementary School, which is in Hartford County, Maryland. We're kind of nestled in the northeastern corner of Maryland, right on the top part of the Chesapeake Bay. Next, please. When I was thinking about today and what I wanted to share regarding creating a, a, an environment that's hospitable to learning, it really made me think about the phrase that time is made for what is valued. And it got me thinking about uh, the trickle-down effect that value can have with a staff. And so when I think about that phrase, time is made for what is valued, it makes me think about what I value as a principal, knowing full well that the things that I value as a principal eventually becomes valued by my staff. And then eventually those things that are valued by the staff then flow down to the students. And so there is a direct correlation between what I value as a principal is what is valued eventually by students in our building. And what should our primary value be as a principal? Next, please. Our, next, our primary value should be learning. And I can tell you with a great deal of certainty that anybody in this building that you ask, or any parent or any student would say to you if you ask them, What's Dr. Carpenter's number one priority at Emerton? They would very quickly say to you that safety is his number one priority, but a very, very close second right there behind is learning. And so when you think about learning and you think about the focus for learning in a school, I think about that old saying from the movie Shrek that there are layers to this, just like there are layers to an onion. But there are uh, four different levels of learning. We look at student learning, we look at teacher learning, family learning, and community learning, but also the learning of our leadership. Before I get to in a bit further to that, I wanted to show you a little bit about Emerton. Next, please. Our school, in a nutshell, we have 555 students. We're a K-5 through school and located in suburban Bel Air, Maryland. Our farms rate at this point in time is 15%. 20 years ago when the school opened, it was at 0%. So we've had a steady incline of free and reduced meals within our building. We 10% of our population receive ESOL student services, and about 12% of our population are special needs students. Despite these things, we have pretty high performance here at Emerton Elementary School, and that's due to the hard work and learning of our outstanding staff. Next, please. Here's some data for you. And when I first arrived here in 2010, approximately 91% of our third grade students were proficient or advanced on our Maryland School Assessment, or MSA. In 2013, it's up to 97%. Uh, when we started in fourth grade in 2010, we were at 94%. Now it's 98% of students proficient or advanced. When I started here in 2010, 91% of our students were proficient or advanced in fifth grade. And last year, we were so excited about this number. 100% of our students in fifth grade were proficient or advanced on MSA, which was a huge, huge reason to celebrate. And I attribute this to a focus on learning from every level, uh, from any position in the building. We are very laser-focused on learning, which is very exciting for us. Next, please. 
So when I think about the layers of learning, the peels of the onion, if you will, when we start with the first layer, student learning, it begs the question, how can I show that student learning is a priority in our school? And really, it starts with the principal. And so knowing that from every venue, from the stage, from car rider duty, from talking with kids, you are about learning, and you share the things about learning for which you're most proud. We always start with good news when we're talking to, in events with our families and our community members. We start with the good stuff, and nine times out of ten, it's focused on really great things that our students are learning. And so we trumpet that from the stage. We trumpet it from Facebook. I trumpet it from my first personal Facebook account, from my personal Twitter account, uh, just the great things that are going on in your school and your community. And that creates a really warm buzz around the community that people want to be in your school and have a very high regard for your school. We also decided that we wanted to make sure that student learning is a priority in our school by showing it ourselves. And so we've littered our hallways with student work. At any given time, when you come into Emerton, you're going to see artwork from our students everywhere. The first showcase that you see when you walk in our building on the left-hand side is grade level work that our students have demonstrated. And it says something like, star light, star bright, Emerton writers love to write. Um, and there is a sample of work from each grade level that we change out monthly. We want our community and anyone that's in our building to see the really great work that our students are showing. And a really great way to get the community involved in, in looking at the student work is every once in a while ask teachers to walk around with post-it notes or you yourself go around with post-it notes and put a note on students' work that's in the hallway. That really shows students that you're seeing it, that you value it, and, and what's really great about it, uh, especially if a former teacher writes a note or the principal writes a note. That's a really exciting thing for a kid to say, wow, Dr. Carpenter put a note on my work. He must really value it. Next, please. Another way that we really uh, trumpet student learning here at Emerton, we do faculty meeting shout outs or when we're in small group settings and we're learning together, we'll talk about what's good. That's been my theme this year when we start meetings. I always start our meetings with what's good, what's going on with kids in your room that's good. It really turns people attention to the good things that students are doing in, in their classrooms and it gives us an opportunity to pat each other on the back. But another way that I really focus on student learning is I walk around every day and in some way. In fact, I too can relate with what Kurt was saying earlier. You can get buried in your classroom or in your office, excuse me. Look, see, I'm thinking like a teacher. Um, but you can get buried in, in your office with emails and other things that need to be done. But for me, I have a really big sign behind my desk that says walk around in very big letters. And it's a very visual reminder that I need to be really out in classrooms and seeing what's going on. And I really make it a point to tell parents through an email or a phone call or during the car rider line at the end of the day what I saw their kids doing. I also try and make it a point to tell the teachers what I see in casual conversation. I might walk up to them during a lull in the part of the lesson and say, I really like the way that you did this. Or I'll just give a simple thumbs up from the back of the classroom. So walking around really shows kids and adults that you value learning as the principal. And for us, the bottom line in everything, in everything that we do is, what is what we're doing in the best interest of students? If it's not, we get rid of it. If it is, we keep doing it. And that's our bottom line at Emerton. Next, please. When we look at the next layer at teacher learning, it's really important that when you're trying to figure out those things that your teachers need to and want to learn about, using data is important. But the first step is making sure that your vision and mission at the school level are aligned to show that learning is at the heart of everything that you do. And when you put that mission on your website, on your publications, everywhere that you, people can see it, they see the, the phrase that keeps popping up is learning, learning, learning. And for teacher learning, we provide layer of opportunities for our teachers to learn. One of the first things that I did when I came to Emerton was to build that concept of professional learning communities and to make sure that they're healthy and that they're strong. And four years later, I can say with a great deal of certainty that our grade level PLCs that meet weekly are very strong and very focused on student achievement. 
The second thing is make your faculty or staff meetings a professional development opportunity instead of information sharing. I have figured out ways to get information out to staff and technology has been a wonderful way for us to do that so that we can then make our professional development time our faculty meeting time. And so that makes it a valuable learning time for teachers. I once had a teacher my first year, we were going to a meeting, we were driving in a car together and she told me, she said, you know Peter, I used to intentionally make doctor's appointments on faculty meeting days because I hated them. But now when we have a faculty meeting, I actually want to be there because I'm learning something from them. And that's the power of making it a PD opportunity instead of information sharing. Another way to encourage teacher learning is to encourage them to get on Twitter and other learning networks and to really start to network with teachers across the country. Here at Emerton this year, we've implemented uh, wonderful Wednesdays, our teachers call them wacky Wednesdays, but we've figured out a way to provide coverage for teachers for two hours in a day, where we, once a week, where we can meet with them for two hours and really dive into unit planning with them. And so that shows your teachers that you are in this, you're down, a, you are getting your hands dirty, you're building units with them, and you should, and that learning is a valued piece of what you do. And another thing that we do is we align our professional development plans for teachers to focus on learning. And the last thing is to demonstrate lessons. And you do them as the principal. Today, I did two demonstration lessons to just today alone. And so it's important for you to go in and show the teachers. You can still teach. And it shows them that when you do go in for observation opportunities, you know what you're talking about. Next, please. We focused on book studies this year and one this summer, and one of the things that we do during the summer is we have a book that teachers have the opportunity to read. And this summer we read a book called Smarter Charts by Martinelli and Mraz, and it was all about how to create anchor charts in your classrooms. And it's a really great opportunity once you read those over the summer to see the follow-up throughout the course of the school year. And these are some examples of follow-up from summer reading that our teachers are physically using in a tangible way with kids in the classroom that's helping to improve student achievement. And we're real proud of our teachers' efforts with this. Next, please. Another way that we encourage teacher learning is to constantly, as the principal, ask teachers, what do you need, and then get it for them. Our job is to remove barriers from getting them from point A to point B, which is student learning. And so our teachers read a lot of books. They get a lot of technology resources that they need. And so our job as the principal is to make sure we get it for them. We participate in a lot of uh, fundraising opportunities to get extra money. Our parent community is phenomenal with that. And so that helps us to get books that teachers can use in classrooms or level libraries or other things that are important to their instruction. We also focus our post-observation conferences on five questions. They're there on the screen. If you read through those five questions, you'll see every single one of those questions focuses on learning. And the last question we always ask our teachers, to me, is the most important one. What's something that you learned that you will now apply in your practice? One thing we did last year as an instructional leadership team, we set up a dashboard in my office on my bulletin board, and it was set up by grade level, kindergarten through fifth grade, special area, and special ed. And every time that we would have a post-observation conference, when a teacher would commit to something, we would write it on a post-it and we'd put it up on our dashboard. Then what we would do is, a couple of weeks later, any administrator could come through my office, pull off a post-it note, go down and talk to the teacher and say, how's that thing you decided to try going? So it loops the learning around and tells the teacher that it's important to us. A really great pragmatic way to get that learning looped around. Next, please. When we look at community learning, we look at it from the perspective of bringing our parents in. And we like to do less formal evenings that look like they're for fun, but we really have a strong learning element to them. And here at Emerton, we have a very strong reading night that we do right around um, January during National Reading Month. We also have arts nights. In other schools I've worked in, we've had family math nights and family STEM nights. So we really try to get the parents in to have fun, but also to learn about what their students are learning. Next, please. We're in the infantile stages of doing this next piece, but I'm very interested in creating a PLN professional learning network with parents on Twitter, where we can start to get feedback from parents through the Twitter network and really get that feedback monthly and, and do something 
with that feedback as a staff. Another way, we make contacts with people all the time. In the car ride or line, we roll down the window and say, hey, I saw Johnny in the classroom today. He was doing some really great thinking. Um, and that really makes parents happy and, and gets them connected. You can also invite community members to be part of your school improvement team and have a say in the goals and the initiatives of your school improvement plan. Next, please. The final layer of the onion is leadership learning, and this is one of the most important ones to me. Um, we really need to make an intentional effort to make sure that all of your leadership at every layer are learning at any given time. And so really making sure that we allow time for students or for teachers to meet, plan, and share. We read together book study style. Right now, my assistant principal and I are reading a book, Teach Like a Pirate, which is a really fun read. Or thinking about ways that we can integrate what we're learning into the classroom. Reading a lot also makes you kind of a content expert. So when a teacher's looking for something, you can provide them with titles of things or just buy the book for them and give it to them and say, this is really good, and start to talk to them about the things they're reading in the book. We also expect all members of our leadership team to be a part of all things instructional. When we score our benchmark assessments with teachers out the gate, we were sitting with them and scoring them and continue to be a resource for them. If they're planning, we like to be part of those opportunities. And we participate in the weekly PLC meetings with our staff members. We're getting started uh, in the starting phases of doing that for this year because we've focused on our wonderful Wednesdays. But I know when I meet with PLCs, I tell them I leave my badge at the door. I'm a member of your team, not facilitating your team. So I'm just another mind around the table, which is really great. Next, please. We, you can hold virtual meetings on Twitter chats. That helps with your leadership learning. And for me personally, Twitter has become my morning professional journal reading. It's my newspaper. I learn more from Twitter now than I have learned from any other um, document that I can get information from. And I get it fast, and I can forward it to um, people. And then the last thing, of course, is conference attendance. Uh, we are big on attending conferences here at Emerton when we have the funds. This last year, I was able to take two or two people with me, my assistant principal and a teacher leader, to a conference. And this year we have an, uh, a goal to take six teacher leaders to us with us to Nashville to the NAESP conference. So we're raising funds to do that because we know that continuous learning translates into increased student achievement in the classroom. And so we want our teachers to be excited about that as well. Next, please. We also need to find time to have fun. And this is just another way that learning, uh, this has nothing to do with learning actually, but it has a lot to do with showing that we like to have a good time. And that's another affective side of the learning process, process and being hospitable to learning is having fun every once in a while. Next, please. And so I wanted to say thank you to NAESP, to the Wallace Foundation, for uh, providing this opportunity to share with you. And in closing, this tile was created, Mosaic, was created by our school community my first year here. Parents, students, teachers, myself, we all created a tile and knitted it together like a quilt. And we wanted it to be the first thing that people see when they walk in the building, and that's what they see. And it's a symbol that we are in this together and we work together. Everything we do, learning-wise, is together. And I think it's a great reminder when I come in in the morning and when I leave at night that we're in this together, no matter what. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Uh, your vision for leadership success certainly is clear in the, in the information that you shared with us as well. We have um, a couple of questions, but before we begin our questioning, uh, Peter, I uh, wanted to announce to the audience that at our national convention, uh, there's the possibility of you doing a session just on all of the uh, support that Twitter has for professional learning. I think that's one area that a lot of principals haven't put a lot of time into or understand the full potential. Todd Whittaker, who wrote the book, What Great Principals Do Differently, also has stated that Twitter is the best professional development opportunity that we can have as teachers or principals. So as recently as last week, I started following him on Twitter to kind of learn what all of that was about. But one of the questions that came in is about Twitter. 
So Peter, I'm just going to start with you. Can you explain a little bit more what it looks like to have a professional learning network on Twitter when you are really limited just to so few characters? Uh, so just give us a little clearer picture about what that looks like. Sure, I'll be glad to. Um, one of the things with Twitter that's fascinating is um, you you create a professional network by following people. And so as Carol alluded to before, you find professionals, uh, and they could be the gurus in a subject area like Todd Whitaker in principal leadership. Uh, I tend to follow uh, Stephanie Harvey, who is a leadership in literacy, Donalyn Miller, NCTM, NAESP is on Twitter. I follow them as well. Um, but once you start following people, you create what's called a network of people and they start posting things onto what's called a feed which is just a line of just statements that they have and what happens is a lot of people will post articles or blog posts or other things and that's where the learning happens you might scroll through and see that Todd Whitaker has posted a little snippet from a blog post that he got from someone else and so you open that up and within two seconds, you've got a whole realm of learning that you can read within five minutes and take back to someone at school or file in your own mental schema or forward to someone who you know needs it. So what you do is you start by following people who you know and then once you start following people you know, you start kind of digging into who they're following and then you start following them as well and then things start popping up. I would say probably about 75% of the people that I follow on Twitter, I have no idea who they are, but I know that they're educational experts by the content that they're sharing or they're district superintendents from around the, the nation. That's the next biggest thing with superintendents. Many of them are tweeting and so I follow a lot of them or their curriculum directors. And so I get a lot of my information from there. Does that make a little bit more sense, Carol? Absolutely. And one of the questions that came in also was, who are the great people or organizations? And I think you mentioned uh, most of them. I would add the Wallace Foundation uh, and ASCD and Learning Forward, um, Joe Murphy from Vanderbilt. Uh, but those, those are really great ideas. So Peter, thank you so much for your expertise and the information. You certainly have expanded our learning uh, this afternoon. Kirk, we have a question for you. Uh, yep. One of the things that we had, you had talked about is your secretary answers so many of the questions that come in and I think you quoted like 90 percent of the school inquiries are uh, from your um, answered by your secretary and although we know that great teachers are retained and successful in schools with great principals and we'll talk about this slide in a minute but you have uh, really stated a quite an important part of the culture of a school as the school secretary. So the question is, what kind of training, what kind of professional development, how do you continuously support that individual who is tasked with such a, a large job responsibility uh, uh, to make sure the school and the uh, operations are are working within that environment? I think the best way to answer that would be to say if she were here and answering that question herself, because it's been asked of her, she would say, I wouldn't want it any other way. Because she w would claim that the most frustrating part of her job prior to us uh, joining together was that so many of the questions that came across her desk, she couldn't answer because she didn't have the information. By using my secretary to channel communications, we have a daily meeting. Every day at 10.30, we sit down, we go through my calendar, we go through every task that I have during the day, and we schedule it into my calendar so that I make sure that I'm getting everything done that has to be done. And in reverse, I then roll out through my secretary any things that I need to put out um, and any objectives I need to fill. 
then she knows the answers to these questions and it virtually eliminates the gotta minutes because people can get their questions answered quickly and don't feel like they just have to wait for my availability to ask them. Um, in terms of training, uh, we've learned these principles together by going through the uh, Breakthrough Coach training with Malachi Pancoast. I've been doing this for uh, going on eight years now. She's been my secretary for just over three years, and we wouldn't have it any other way. Great, 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 uh, great ideas and uh, great information. Uh, you have, and on, on the slide right now, Kirk, I'm going to stay with you just for another minute. Uh, we talk about yep. great teachers and how they stay, how they are motivated uh, to do their very, very best. All of you, Susan, Kirk, and Peter, have fabulous schools, and that comes not by accident. It's by intentionally doing the work that you do uh, deliberately, as Susan would say. And we know from the research from the Wallace Foundation that teachers will perform their best in schools when they have the support of their principal to develop their skills when they have professional learning communities that are really true to the theory of what professional learning communities that are successful um, result in and clearly acknowledge their contributions to leading student achievement. This all circles back to that first poll that we had. Uh, the poll stated that teachers um, will stay in schools where the conversation is all about good instruction and this really reinforces that. But Kirk, the question that um, we have for you is that you quoted an expert about teachers having the responsibility to push back on the rationale for change yeah. and to have their questions answered as to why change is uh, taking place as led by the principal. Can you share with us again the name of that expert you had quoted and maybe uh, what resource it came from? Yeah, that's Mike Matos. He is po part of the uh, PLC network with the DeFores and Bob Aker. And you'll often, he speaks at all the PLC institutes that they travel to throughout the year. And uh, his, his, he was very specific about when he presented that notion. And it was presented to, to a group of principals saying, you can't expect people to change because you walked into a room and said we need to change. You have to change because there's a compelling reason. There's something out there that is, that is good, that is noble, that is admirable to do. And when you have that compelling reason to move forward, the likelihood that you're going to have the energy of your faculty behind you is far greater than, than it would be otherwise. And so he talks about that. Not only do teachers have the, the right to push back, they have the responsibility to push back if you do not provide compelling reasons for change. Thank so he's a wonderful speaker and writer. I, I would highly suggest uh, learning more about him. Sounds like a uh, Twitter follower to me. <laughs> Great. Thank you so you much. Uh, Susan, uh, there was a question right at the very beginning when you started your presentation. and. It's quite obvious that you are a communications expert that really promotes open and honest communication between all the stakeholders in your um, leadership community. So the question was, and all of you are principal mentors, uh, what advice, Susan, would you give a new principal moving into a school with low morale based on really, really poor communication? Where would that new principal start when taking over the leadership of a failing school is so overwhelming and if the principal knows the communication has to be a priority? Um, I think that many, many of us have, um, have approached those different situations in regards to arriving in a new building and, and really taking a look at um, what, what is working and what is not working in the building. And regardless of how um, 
uh, ineffective certain things are. There's, uh, there's things that are working in the building. So one, I, I would first highlight um, systems or areas that are positive. Because regardless of how needy every building might be, there's always things that are going well. So that's the first thing is to start off with what might be perceived as a strength for the school. And um, we don't want to put everything into people's, um, sometimes people's perceptions turn into people's opinions. And reality and opinion tend to be different things. So um, having a gauge, you have to be very strong about what you believe in regardless of um, what building you're placed in. I've um, actually been a principal at three different schools, um, two of them for short um, stints. But my philosophy and my belief regarding children is the same regardless of what um, building I work in. And so having that um, strong belief about what you think is best for children is um, something that has to be, um, again, with those very deliberate actions of walking into a building. This is my belief system. This is what I think is important. But also bringing in some of those deliberate actions of, um, of listening to really find out what, what are the driving forces. And um, it's a wonderful opportunity to really um, listen to where, um, what their stakeholder audience is. If it's a teacher that um, has a concern about communication, is it really important for um, this method of communication to be important? Or sometimes it's not even the what, it's the how. Um, and we, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about change and you know, all the different individuals that have spoken today, that change is going to be difficult regardless. But having, um, having people or stakeholders have a, um, a level of involvement is huge. It's just huge. And letting them know that their voices are heard. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. And um, we would like to invite all of our audience to uh, join us in our next webinar. Our next webinar is Cultivating Leadership in Others on December 10th. Please join us. Uh, learn from expert principals about this area. Uh, we would also like to share with you some resources. Uh, again, you can download this webinar from the NASP website. Uh, supported through the funding from the Wallace Foundation. Peter mentioned uh, taking teachers to our national conference in Nashville, Tennessee in July 2014. Uh, if you join us there, we will have some sessions um, promoted through the Wallace Foundation. And all of our speakers, including Susan, Peter, and Kirk, uh, we'll be there for you to meet and talk, talk to personally. So at this point, we would like to thank our audience and a great deal of thanks go to our principal experts, Susan Holliday, Peter Carpenter, and Kirk Downing. Thank you so much. This concludes our webinar for today.